Basic movements that work a muscle, repetitive movements that work a muscle over and over again, combined with nutritional therapy, so just a good diet, will help your metabolic health, which will, will help you to prevent chronic diseases as well. So, so things like cancer and so on. Should we be drinking a gallon of water a day? Are we drowning ourselves or are we right on the nose? That's a layered question. The water that we consume doesn't only come from the water that we drink in bottles. Dr. Natalie Nume Chokif. Mm -hmm. Natalie is a functional medicine doctor. She's also a general practitioner and she has been in this field now and doing incredible work. And I think it's important in the, in the stage that we're at where you can find all these different types of advice on social media that we hear from an expert. Natalie has been a great help in my own life. She has helped me for the most part of this year <laughs> with some gut issues that I, I also have and I've learned so much through her. So now I'm bringing it to you. I wanted to start with like a general definition of what functional medicine is. Functional medicine is coined as root cause medicine. Okay. And what that really means is when we are looking at somebody's health in total, you know, the body's supposed to operate in a specific way, which is mm -hmm. our physiology. And when someone's physiology goes off, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, they become sick, they get exposed to a virus, they get COVID, the physiology goes off. Right. Okay. And usually in conventional medicine, which is traditional medicine, we treat symptoms. Right. So if you have a chronic sinusitis, what we would do is give you sinus medication right. and maybe tell you avoid certain foods and so on. That's what the conventional medicine world would usually do. In functional medicine, we dig a little deeper beneath the surface. So right. we're looking to see where in your physiology has gone off and how can we help it to restore function so that your symptoms become less. Right. So there's absolutely a need for the pharmaceuticals yeah. where it would be to alleviate the symptoms, but it isn't getting to the root cause of why a certain person's physiology may go off to mm -hmm. begin with. It's a deeper level of healing. We're, we're looking and, and paying much closer attention to an individual person's physiology because right. you may develop a sinusitis for one particular reason. You have another person who has the same symptoms, yeah. but the reason that they're struggling with those symptoms may be different. It could be maybe for you that, you know, your diet is very processed, you eat a lot of um, unhealthy types of dairy. For this person, they may be living in a mold ridden right. area. So there's no cookie cutter way of treating one patient in functional medicine, which makes it really interesting because we spend a lot of time getting to know the individual mm -hmm. and their life mm -hmm. and what they've been through, mm -hmm. what their living conditions are like, um, what they're eating, what their job is like, you know, where their stressors are coming from. It gives us an idea about the nervous system. And the beautiful thing is that you may have someone that comes in for gut issues right. or something very specific and something that they've been struggling with for a long time. But at the end of it all, when working with the individual, we uncover so many layers of their health mm -hmm. that it's like, okay, we're going to work on that. But let's look at your, again, at the underlying physiology, help to identify dysfunction, mm -hmm. help to restore function. And not only do you get a resolution of the symptoms that they first came in with, you also have the opportunity to educate them. Mm -hmm. Your health is your number one priority, right? It's the, it's the one thing that gets you up to work, present for your children, present for your family, and just to achieve the goals. So mm -hmm. like the point that you made, and I want to just underscore that conventional medicine go hand in hand Absolutely. or go along with functional medicine. Mm -hmm. So Natalie is the medical director at Three Hearts uh, Healing, Healing and, Nutrition, and Center. Nutrition Center, which has a focus on cancer patients, mm -hmm. but also provides coaching. Mm -hmm. and so I was going to ask you, what's one of the most common things you've noticed in treating your patients, for example, cancer patients, that functional medicine has done for them? Three Hearts has a, a, a history. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Three Hearts was, was birthed 
through uh, the managing director. Her name yeah. is Carol. Yeah. Um, hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. Love you. <laughs> she would have had her journey with cancer. Yeah. And at the time, she didn't have much support in terms of what she was offered was like chemo and radiation right. and traditional forms of cancer treatment. And so through that, she kind of went on a journey of searching for holistic or um, additional alternative, not alternative treatments, but complementary treatments mm -hmm. to not just treatments, but how do I get healthier? Yeah. I've been diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. What do I eat? Um, yeah. How did I get here? What do I need to do to heal my body? Is there more that I need to know? Is there more beyond the chemo, the pharmaceuticals and the surgery? Is there more beyond that? And Honestly, it's the same when we have someone who has developed cancer. Um, it is the same approach yeah. in terms of what is stressing you out? What are you eating? How are you taking care of yourself? Um, are, are you missing vitamins and nutrients? Uh, it's the same functional medicine approach that we would apply to any person who becomes unwell. No one can determine the the, determine the fate of someone who has been diagnosed with cancer. Um, we can only support people to the best of our ability. Right. Improving someone's quality of life mm -hmm. and reducing their risk of redeveloping cancer or reducing progression of cancer, I think that's a win. Yeah. You know, yeah. as opposed to just being like, well, this is what you're going to do, radiation, chemo, surgery, and, that, and then that's it for you. Right. It gives people hope, it empowers them, mm -hmm. and again, it brings a conscientiousness around their, their health um, and what they, and an awareness as to what they've kind of probably been doing for the last 40 years and not being aware that this may have been detrimental to their health that could have contributed to them developing cancer. Right. So it's not a pie in the sky diagnosis that you don't just get cancer just like that. There are reasons and there's cr like a long period of dysfunction that happens before someone actually mm. develops cancer. So a lot of our work is yes, supporting patients who have developed cancer, but also educating people to get a grip on their health to prevent them right. from or reducing right. their risk of ever developing it. Right. And so, Generally, we've heard people talk about the gut being like the first brain. How, for someone who's completely new to this, how can we, how do they come to understand the importance of the gut to your holistic health? So and what does that mean? Your gut is your first brain. There's a lot of evidence, a lot of studies um, that show the link between the gut and the brain. Okay, so there's a lot of information now that is available to us that is informing us that when there is dysfunction in the gut, it actually could be contributing to psychiatric conditions. Mm -hmm. So um, anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar, uh, schizophrenia. And the reason for that is that the majority of our happy hormones are made in our gut. A lot of them are made in our gut. And I think with functional medicine, we pay attention to the digestive tract because it's so central to many bodily functions. Mm -hmm. There's a saying, you know, uh, when in doubt, treat the gut. As it relates to mental health, it also relates to hormones. Right. Absorption, so what happens in the gut when we eat food, we actually absorb vitamins and nutrients. So the, the fuel that we eat and that we put into our body, that process of digestion, which is so important, allows for certain vitamins and minerals to become available to the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. So if you have dysfunction happening in the gut, you're going to see manifestations of multiple um, areas of dysfunction. So you might see um, depression, anxiety, severe fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, you may have hormonal imbalances. Um, you may have gut infections, mm -hmm. so you, you may have actual gut symptoms, which is interesting too because you don't have to have gut symptoms to have an unhealthy gut. You might have hormonal issues and not right. necessarily have gut issues, Okay. but your gut needs to be treated. And hormonal issues look like what? Hormonal issues um, for men and women, but um, I'll focus on women for now, uh, irregular periods, right. severe PMS, very painful periods, heavy periods, uh, bleeding between periods, 
uh, weight gain. Mm -hmm. You might have depression in there as well. Uh, for women who have developed things like conditions like endometriosis, mm -hmm. which is an inflammatory condition, very painful. Uh, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, where you can have weight gain, um, hair growth, which right. you know can be really devastating, um, darkening of the skin. Right. So there's uh, infertility. Those are a couple things. For men, poor libido. Mm -hmm. uh, for women too, poor libido, struggling through menopause, doing that when women transition, you know, around the age of 50, when they transition through menopause and, you know, you have that sudden drop of hormones, um, having weight gain, depression, sweats, mm -hmm. um, those are all signs of hormonal issues. When in doubt, treat the gut. And I like, I like that you say that because just e even going through my own stuff, I realize how important the gut and nutrition and the things that we should eat are. But just as you touched on there and and, I, and this is something that also I've always heard of, but really just resonated with me more recently, the importance of women knowing about their hormones. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, a lot of the times that might be an oversight as to like why something is happening in your, in your body. So can you tell us a little bit, like for women, what should women be doing in terms of their hormones and understanding the hormones? One thing I also learned is that your cycle is a vital sign mm, so okay. what that means is you know when you go to the doctor usually your blood pressure is a vital sign mm -hmm. they, they check your blood pressure your heart rate your blood sugars these are vital signs so it tells us about your health in this moment right. and your period is one of them mm -hmm. so i would say first developing an awareness around your hormones is by looking at your cycle what is happening there what is the history of your cycle so, you know, how old were you when you first got your period? Um, how regular is your period? Do you get it every month or so? Everyone is genetically different. So not everyone's gonna have the same exact cycle, but generally you're having a monthly period. And so it's, you know, if that happens, you miss a period for three months and then you don't see your period for two months. And then again, it happens for another three months. Um, you may be offered in the conventional world, you may be offered birth control to regulate that. But that's not dealing with the stress that you're having or the poor nutrition that you're having or uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies that you may be having or the insomnia. You mm -hmm. understand? It's yeah. not really helping to restore the physiology that went off in the first place that caused right. you to miss your right. period. A lot of the general population seems to be the conversation around depression and anxiety seems to be increasing. Mm -hmm. So what are some simple things everyday things that people can do to treat their gut health or maintain their gut health in a way that helps with depression and anxiety. Another question that has layers. When you have someone, when, you have, when you're having a symptom, we tend to want to do something about it mm -hmm. or add something to the situation to treat it or to fix it. But my approach is always to look and see what's causing it in the first place right. and what can we remove that may be contributing to the problem right. so uh, for example if you are having severe anxiety there may be a social element to that where say you're having stress at work or right. it may be something external that is obviously impacting your 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 mental health at that time but if you're eating a bunch of garbage at the same time, I promise you that your, your anxiety is gonna be 10 times worse, right. worse. And your ability to manage that anxiety or even logically think through it is gonna be impaired. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is, you know, one of the foundations of our physical health and just keeping this really basic is what we put into our bodies, mm -hmm. right? And what we're, what we're eating on a daily basis. If, so what I would say is if I have someone who comes to me with severe anxiety, you know, they're not usually asking me, what do I do about my gut health? Um, but I would tell them, okay, we need to clean up. Yeah. You're having severe anxiety. Um, some people may be on pharmaceuticals, which is fine because it needs to be managed. But what can we do to peel back some of the layers and like kind of help to restore that normal physiological function 
in your gut and therefore in the rest of your body mm -hmm. and so i like to start with diet right nutrition is really really important what you're putting into your body is your body processing it well um you know are you drinking water are you staying hydrated that's really important uh another thing so this goes back to what can i do less of right. and what can i do more yeah, of as well yeah. mm -hmm. but it's mostly what can I do less of? Because mm -hmm. most of the time we're doing something too, too right? We're doing too much of something <laughs> that's causing the problem, right. right? I'm gonna ask you like a series of questions. What should we not eat? What should we try as much as possible not to eat, mm -hmm. stay away from? When we think, and I'm gonna make this really, really simple. Yeah. The more we move away from what we call whole foods, which are things that come straight from the earth that have not been processed the more we move away from that and into processed things mm -hmm. foods shampoos whatever products um the more dysfunction we'll see in our bodies and we're seeing right. it in society now and yeah. as a population we're seeing more ill health yeah. let, me, let me tell you what we should be eating first yes okay okay ahead, because i think that's i think people get really afraid when we tell them you know to cut out certain things like, oh, what am i going to eat but yeah. there's actually Again, it brings a conscientiousness around your food and understanding that there's actually so much that you can eat. Yeah. Maybe things that you're not accustomed to eating, yeah. which is why it's it's a big change, yeah. but the first step to change is awareness, yeah. okay? So I would say I encourage people to get their food as minimally processed as possible. So having, and Barbados is such a perfect place for that. Mm -hmm. huh? it, we in the Caribbean, we are so, blessed yes, yeah. with our food our produce just the quality of food that we get here our starches should be coming from ground provisions so mm -hmm. sweet potatoes plantains breadfruits green bananas cassavas butternut mm -hmm. squash pumpkin edos yeah that's mainly where our starches yeah. should be coming from mm -hmm. now the first thing people will say well i ain't got the time to cook that mm -hmm. which is fair mm -hmm. but awareness is key right mm -hmm. and we don't expect major change to begin with we have to start with understanding, yeah. being aware and understanding how our diet has evolved to what it is today and how can we, our diet has evolved to, to something unhealthier in these days and so has our health. It has also evolved into ill health. Yeah. We're seeing a lot more chronic diseases, more yeah. cancers, autoimmune diseases. So we need to go back yeah. and simplify things mm -hmm. and so that's one thing is is eating less processed foods having more food straight from the earth that's starches yeah. if you're talking about fats um so i'm going to give you a little basic nutrition session right here <laughs> you have what we call macronutrients right. which are like proteins carbohydrates and fats and you have micronutrients which are like vitamins minerals yeah. Um, that come in certain foods and so on. You need all of these things. Mm -hmm. Our macros, starches should come from ground provisions. Proteins can come from lean meats. Um, you can have lean pork, lean beef, fish, right. um, eggs. Uh, for my vegan friends, you can also have chickpeas, lentils, uh, black beans, organic soybeans. That's proteins. And then you have healthy fats that come from avocados, yeah. nuts and seeds, cashews, yeah. almonds, coconut oil, olive yeah. oil, these types of things. Those are macronutrients. Yeah. And then micronutrients come from those, really the foods, those foods actually. You get micronutrients from those foods, from whole right. foods. Fruits, vegetables as well, they have colors. I always encourage people to eat as local as possible, especially when it comes to fruits. Yeah. You know, we tend to glorify things like strawberries and blueberries, which are beautiful, but they don't grow here. Yeah. And they come a very long way. Yeah. And they're heavily sprayed yeah. so that the bugs don't get them. Right. In Barbados, no one is spraying our mangoes. No, no one is spraying our golden apples, our star fruit, yeah. our plantains, our bananas, yeah. you know, sugar apples. There's no one spraying them. We have the most high quality fruit, I think, in my opinion. I've yeah. been around the world a bit. I think that we have some of the most high quality yeah. fruit in the world. Yeah. You mentioned micronutrients. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, in a, again, in a very simple way, 
what are some basic vitamins that everyone should be taking? In an ideal and perfect world, we shouldn't have to take vitamins because we would be having food off the land and right. we would be adequately nourished and we wouldn't be under such stressful conditions right. and not everybody's trying to, you know, fighting to make a living. And um, so I would say in an ideal world, we shouldn't need that stuff. Yeah. Um, but the reality is that as society has evolved and we as people have evolved and our life style has evolved, we at this stage, we don't get the quality of food that we need. We don't get the, the rest that we need for our bodies to repair. And so this is where vitamins and supplements now um, are at the forefront of holistic health. Right. Different people need different things. And maybe it's because I know too much about <laughs> vitamins and nutrients. I have a hard time, you know, telling people, oh, just take down. this. Yeah, yeah, like you should take this, you should take that. I, I am very, very, very intentional with when prescribing vitamins, supplements and minerals. Um, because you may need it for a certain period of time uh, for whatever it is that you're going through and then you may not need it after that. Right. So I don't really believe in taking vitamins forever and right. ever. Mm -hmm. um, I do, but however, there are some people who, if they're not healthy, you might put them on a lot of vitamins and, and nutrients to kind of like build them back up right. and put them on for, for a period of time and then take them off. Okay. So to answer your question, uh, we should be intentional with what we use. Right. And there are thousands of medicinal supplements that we could use that are good right. for you. You know, there's ashwagandha and then yeah. there are omegas, and there's magnesium. Yeah. There's so many different things and we cannot take them all. Right. So it really depends on what you need. Right. In, in clinical practice, I found my go-to's um, have been omega-3 fatty acids, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, which often are extracted from fish oils, so mm -hmm. shark oil, really, right. which is what people can get from the market again here in Rhode <laughs> yeah. Um Incredibly therapeutic, uh, anti-inflammatory. It's important for uh, brain function, mm -hmm. especially for people who are aging. Women with hormonal imbalances that may have inflammation, and we also need healthy fats to build our hormones. Uh, once you're not on blood thinners and stuff like that, again, you see, whereas yeah. there's some people that you have to be very particular. Not yeah. everything that's natural is safe for everyone. Yeah. There is no one size fit all. Exactly. And you need to understand that even though there's a, there might be a general standard, you have to know individualistically what mm -hmm. is important for you because yes. you don't know if you are the general or, or not. So this might seem like a controversial question, but I, I think it's necessary to ask, do you think there's an optimal diet? Yes. Uh, and I think it's a whole foods diet. Okay. And whether that falls as vegan or carnivore or... You see, the, the, the commonality of all of the fad diets now, like a, a vegan, carnivore diet, um, keto, well, not necessarily keto, but the reason they work is because they eliminate the same things, which is processed food. But I don't think that there's a one size fits all. Earlier you spoke about stress. You hear a lot, stress can cause disease in the body. Can you talk a little bit about like how that happens? Like how, how does stress actually do that? And I don't know that people know that they're under stress. What is stress? What it translates to, to the physical body is the nervous system becomes overactivated. Now, stress can come from different reasons so different things going on in people's lives so losing a loved one come from stress in the workplace stress in a relationship stress with raising kids but what that translates to physically is that our stress mechanism in our body is our nervous system and there are two sides to your nervous system there is the stress response mm -hmm. which is what we call fight or flight mm -hmm and there is rest, repair, and digest. Mm -hmm. If you imagine that your body is wired with electricity, mm -hmm. that is your nervous system. And that electricity is required for bodily functions, regular bodily functions. So you, you need that electricity for that rest, repair, and digest nervous system. So your gut is wired with electricity that helps us to churn food and 
absorb food and digest. Our heart is wired with electricity so that it can pump. Every single organ in our body is wired with electricity. And that's what happens in, in rest, repair and digest. So you have normal physiological function at that time. Now, the fight or flight response is what we call the stress response. Mm -hmm. And that becomes activated when we are exposed to stressful conditions. And not just external stressful conditions, also within the body. Mm -hmm. If you have a chronic infection or a chronic inflammation, that also puts your body into the stress response, mm -hmm. which is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have that fight or flight part of your nervous system being constantly activated for whatever reason, whether it is those social, external, I guess, um, challenges that you might be experiencing, and maybe at the same time you're having that inflammation in the body, maybe because of what you're eating or you have a chronic infection, that activates the stress response. Now, the fight or flight response and the rest, repair and digest response cannot exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen is you become more wired in one direction mm -hmm. when you're constantly stressed or you go through a very stressful period and it pulls from that rest, repair and digest. Mm -hmm. So often people who are chronically stressed, so stressed for a long period of time, um, may experience physiological dysfunction because they're not digesting properly, they're not repairing, um, they're not sleeping. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in itself, if it goes on for long enough, you can have the manifestation of disease in different areas of your body right. or dysfunction, not necessarily disease, but dis yeah, disease and dysfunction um, where your physiology goes off. Right. So then for someone who's like watching this and they're like, but I can't help, like my life has stress mm -hmm. in it, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe their circumstances, they just lost a parent or someone close to them or they're a CEO of a company or something like that. So naturally, they're in a phase of life where stress is unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can they do? Simple things that they can do on a day-to-day -day basis to lean towards the rest, repair, mm -hmm. and, digest. and digest. While we cannot change the external circumstances, we have to manage them. The first part is awareness and being aware that your nervous system becomes overactivated. Right. And what signs of that might be like, because you were saying, well, I might not even know that I'm stressed. Right. But signs of nervous system overactivation may be lack of sleep, bloating when you eat, mm -hmm. um, not digesting your food properly, feeling really tired. And what tends to happen too is that usually when we're stressed, we're not eating well. You're, you're, in fight or flight so you know you're, you're in a rush you have to eat something very quickly and that can kind of exacerbate the issue one is becoming aware you know are you uptight are you having a lot of you know maybe some pain in your shoulders are you having joint pain are you tired a lot are you irritated how is your mood are you on guard all the time you know people mm -hmm. talk to you and you're like you know a bullet ready to go these are i guess telltale signs that you might be stressed and also, I guess, zooming out and observing, you know, how is my life going? Right. Is it going the way that I want to go, mm -hmm. that I want it to go? Those are, those are ways in which you may be able to identify that you're, that you're stressed out, mm -hmm. right? How to manage it. This is why we have counseling services, right. right? Because a lot of life coaching is required uh, for some persons in order for them to get their health together. It's not as simple as telling someone, oh, you're stressed, you need to just change your diet. It's really helping people to break down, compartmentalize, analyze, and you know, your planner would be one of those things, right? Yeah. Because it helps you to kind of lay it all out and, and, and compartmentalize and set goals. Really help peel off the layers right. and look at it. Holistically. Holistically. Yeah. More often than not, I offer our counseling services to our patients so that they can unpack some of that right. and, and get on the journey of health yeah. um, because it is such an important part of your physical health, mm -hmm. you know, managing your nervous system, um, understanding your own patterns and how you may be showing up. Um, understanding how your, you know, some, maybe some beliefs or maybe past experiences really drive your behaviors and your choices and, and your beliefs, you know, and something as simple as, and I've seen this before several times, you know, and personally and with, with working with patients, 
you may have someone who is just generally very angry mm -hmm. okay and obviously something has happened in their life they may not even know that they're angry yeah, yeah. right <laughs> but something has happened in their life along the way that has made them angry right. you know for example someone that passed on in their life and they're angry that the person la like passed yeah. on and you know yeah. they might not yeah. have made life peace just didn't go, go out, exactly yeah. and they haven't made peace with the situation and um sometimes it's not that the person doesn't have a right to be angry but the reason that they're angry is because the way they perceive the situation mm -hmm. which may not even be truth mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and bringing people into that kind of awareness and not telling people how to think or how to be or to just think positive, but it's leading them into a, a, a mental space where they can make their own breakthroughs and discoveries. Right. So they can say, you know, lead them to a point where you can make peace with that anger. Yeah. Or yeah. if you have reason to be angry, making peace with it or realizing that, oh, I perceived the situation incorrectly or in a way that wasn't truthful. Mm -hmm. So I really have nothing to be angry about. Mm -hmm. And that is a breakthrough. Right. When managing stress, sometimes it involves life coaching. Right. It involves um, providing a safe space for people to share um, where they're at in life and also helping them. It's not just about giving them advice, but for helping them to make their own self discoveries. Right, right. I like to get down to the very practical stuff that anybody watching can just right now turn this off and go do something. Let's break down a day if we can, possibly. Mm -hmm. You wake up in the morning. How do you start your day? What do you, what, what's a good way to start? To start your day. Yeah. Okay. I am not perfect. <laughs> None of so us are. None it us varies are. <laughs> and it's not like this every single day but what i would say is a good day yeah um you know you want to be aligned you want to be focused you want to be prepared for the day ahead right. and i before i get out my bed i you know i like to get up early enough that i have time right. to to do stuff before my day actually starts so yeah. work before work and stuff starts um but just laying in bed and doing deep breaths, right. centering yourself, prayer is, mm -hmm. is a really big one for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really connecting and, you know, asking for guidance and wisdom and courage to execute the day and, and to, to move through the day as God's will. You know, yeah. I, I have, I'm a believer and I have faith. And then after that, we get up. Is there something we should be drinking? Because you know, there are all these thoughts about the first thing that you should drink mm -hmm. in the morning or the first thing you should eat. So let's talk about break, breaking fast. fast. There is no one size fits all. Yeah. And I know there's so many, there's so many things out there that are medicinal. You know, you have ancient medicine there. You know, people say drink apple cider vinegar with water, which right. is good for you. Lemon water in the morning. Yeah. Um, that's fine. Uh, some people drink tea in the morning. That's fine. But it really we don't have to complicate it you try it yeah. and see how you feel yeah. you yeah. know what i would say to you though mm -hmm. as a coffee drinker <laughs> i love coffee i've grew, uh, grown up on coffee been yeah. drinking turkish coffee from you know in my in my late teens um so very strong coffee but what i would say is don't have coffee first, first thing in the morning mm -hmm. on an empty stomach mm -hmm. and the reason for that is Coffee is a stimulant. It causes our cortisol levels to rise, mm -hmm. which is our stress hormone. Mm -hmm. And in normal human physiology, we need cortisol to mm -hmm. get up in the morning and get a pep in our step. But if we drink coffee first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, you're now becoming dependent on coffee to do that. Allowing your body to have that normal physiological rise in cortisol in the morning is important. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say if you are a coffee drinker, especially if you have anxiety mm -hmm. or if you are very stressed mm -hmm. um, or if you think based on what we've discussed that you <laughs> might be in fight or flight, coffee is not going to be your friend. Is coffee good or is coffee bad? That's, it, it, it depends. Right. You know, it's not on bad you. on its yeah. own, but it depends on your body. And then for people, so people are like, OK, but I want to eat healthy. But I just don't know what to eat. It's so mm -hmm. confusing. What do you think is a good breakfast? Breakfast does not always have to be the classic pancakes and waffles and eggs. Right. 
right? Or cereal. Um, or cereal. Um, people tend to, we, I think we tend to categorize uh, what breakfast should look like. Yeah. So it limits us to breakfast options. Right. But what I would say is keeping it really simple. I love eggs, yeah. um, the whole egg with yeah. the yolk. The whole cholesterol thing in eggs has been disproven. Right. Um, we need healthy cholesterol. The yeah. yolk of the egg has healthy cholesterol in it. We need it for our hormones. We need it for our brain. Um, so eggs is a good source of protein. Mm -hmm. Other sources of protein for breakfast, you can have salt fish, you right. have tuna. And if you please, you want, you can have fish. Otherwise, you can have chicken, you can have beef, whatever, yeah. you can have leftovers for breakfast. Like it can be whatever <laughs> you want it to be. Right. You know, I think, as I said, I think our mind is geared toward having a certain type of thing mm -hmm. for breakfast. But to generalize it a little bit, I think the most important thing for breakfast is having a protein Right. Right. Because mm -hmm. um, it's going to keep you full. It's going to stabilize your blood sugars. Mm -hmm. And you can combine that with a starch. So the same ones I lifted, listed mm -hmm. off, all of those go, I get it. No one's peeling a yam for breakfast. You know, <laughs> no. we know. But if you had steam yam from yesterday, you know, or you have a plantain that steams very quickly, um, or you have some fruits, you can right. have that alongside your protein. Right. And if you were to, if we had the ability to grow, a garden like everybody mm -hmm. had the ability to mm -hmm. just have a small little garden for mm -hmm. themselves we're not sending you to build no farm but like you yeah. could just do a kitchen something what would be some good herbs and stuff to have i like um peppermint mm -hmm. for salads and it grows wild it's like once you put it on peppermint it grows very very quickly it doesn't need a lot of green thumbing which right. i don't have basil yeah rosemary mm -hmm. great for lamb fish meats bay leaf is always a great one yeah. you make a bay leaf tea we have a bay leaf tea by my parents house and we just every night just take two leaves and boil it in water and yeah. you can have that for you know before you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning so you have you have something to do something with what are some really big myths that you find in like that's out there that people tend to follow that are like misguided i wouldn't say this is a, a myth per se, um, but what I would say it's perhaps a misconception that you can un undo damage by using something that's good for you. Mm. So for example, um, you might be having, you know, lots of uh, bread or flour in your diet and not getting enough proteins and, you know, maybe have a processed food diet, but you're drinking ginger tea at night. Right. Or or you're t and you feel like you know that's you know undoing it's balancing yeah. yeah or or that you're using a bunch of supplements and your diet isn't good mm -hmm. like I always say it's not about adding what might be good for you into your diet alone it's about removing the things that might be creating havoc within right. your body right. so having a foundational understanding of what a healthy nourishing diet looks like or what it can look like. I think is critical for for health there's this theory that i read on recently um that i've kind of been deep diving into it's called the blue zone theory mm -hmm. uh where they're like there there's a study of nine different regions in the world that have the largest number of centenarians mm -hmm. um and so in their societies they break down almost like try to template what a healthy lifestyle would look like so from a lot of what we spoke about already you know like having a sacred hour which in the morning which is like prayer deep breathing that kind of stuff um your vegetables your whole foods that kind of thing growing things off the land but another element that they included is exercise or walking mm -hmm. not necessarily exercise but like walking a lot movement. of these movement movement mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so as we round up the conversation about like nutrition and gut health and holistic health, can you just like bookend it with what do you think or how important uh, exercise and movement is to your long-term health? 
I don't think it's a secret that mm -hmm. exercise is good for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I think everybody knows that exercise is good for you and there have been so many studies and, you know, yeah. like exercise is good for you. Yeah. I think the challenge is people finding a method of movement that works for them in their daily life. Mm -hmm. And similar to the diet, getting confused about what the, what's the best thing, what's the best yeah. thing for you. And what I would say is you just need to move. Yeah. We have long beaches in Barbados, mm -hmm. you know, take a walk on the beach. Not only will it allow for physiological stimulation, so exercise, that movement, yeah. that heart beating and so on, but it's also a decompressor, you know, it puts you in that rest, repair and digest nervous right. system. It helps you to right. relax. Yeah. Um, you know, some people, their jobs entail a lot of physical labor, but yeah. most of us are not in that <laughs> and that job yeah. you know so it's really just taking time out of your day to to implement some form of movement mm -hmm. um, that generates sweat and and can activate your muscles a really interesting point at this stage in science as we speak of weightlifting mm -hmm. the mu muscles in our body now are being um, the science is now revealing that they're actually metabolic organs. Mm. What I mean by that is they're finding that people who have less muscle mm -hmm. and more fat are metabolically unhealthy. Mm. So are they be more prone to things like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, which might be sometimes why we see people who are slim still have high cholesterol, diabetes right. and high blood pressure. Right. And it isn't because they have a lot of fat. It is because they have a very little muscle ratio. and yes, yeah. the muscle to fat ratio mm -hmm. is, is not, um, there's more fat than there is muscle. What science is showing now, and this is why resistance training is now, it's in, it's in the forefront because, yeah. at this time because we're really, the, the way that we're approaching metabolic diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure is by building muscle. Mm -hmm. That is uh, um, helping to build muscle and reduce that fat and mm. that happens through resistance training it doesn't mean you have to go and be doing olympic lifts and crossfit right. that's yeah. not what it means basic movements that work a muscle repetitive movements that work a muscle over and over again combined with nutritional therapy so just a good diet mm. will help your metabolic health which will, will help you to prevent chronic diseases as well so so things like cancer and so on yeah. so that is that is something i would i would like to mention about yeah. exercise that it's uh, we're finding that yes movement is important mm -hmm. and it's not to make it more complex but we are finding that there is really an effective way to combat metabolic diseases by building muscle, muscle. in the body and reducing mm -hmm. fat content should we be drinking a gallon of water a day are we drowning ourselves or are we, are we right on the nose? That's a layered question. The water that we consume doesn't only come from the water that we drink in bottles. It okay. also comes from the food that we eat. So you get water content from fruit and so on. It's important to stay hydrated. You know, this is kind of complex and I don't like to make things complex because people are like, this is just unrealistic. Like we just can't live this way. Water <laughs> is not just h2o it's supposed to be all right water that we consume is supposed to be mineralized right all right you're supposed to have sodium and potassium magnesium in your water and that's because where not water comes from the earth mm -hmm. and how it becomes mineralized is that it passes through the stones of the earth right yeah. so you know that's where we get our our minerals from now unfortunately the water that we're drinking as globally it's mm -hmm. not just, you know, I'm not just speaking about Barbados, but globally, um, it's now running through pipelines mm -hmm. and it's treated mm -hmm. with fluoride and chlorine and, and things to keep it clean and it's demineralized. Mm -hmm. So for lack of better words, we're drinking dead water. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's tough, man. It's so <laughs> tough. Like you just, you know, and this isn't, you know, we're not having this conversation to frustrate people, yeah. but it's just, it's remember awareness is key. Yeah. It's first. We're yeah. not going to fix it. We'll probably drink, continue to drink dead water for a while um, until we figure out how to mineralize our water. Yeah. Um, but there are ways that you can mineralize your right. water. You know, um, health shops sell, sell mineral salts, yeah. mineral drops. Also by taking certain vitamins and minerals like magnesium, yeah. using something as simple as a magnesium supplement helps you to 
absorb water better. So mm -hmm. the importance of water being mineralized, what I'll tell you is when you're drinking water, it's not supposed to just pass through you. So if you're drinking a lot of water, and you're just peeing all the time, right. you're probably not absorbing your water. Mm. So some people may be dehydrated a lot, like they find their skin is dry or their mm. lips are dry. They like, if I drink water all the time, it's probably that they're not, their water is not mineralized or their body may be lacking the components that help us to absorb, absorb. water. Mm. So it absorbs and goes into our cells. It right. gives our skin that flush, right. you know, plush look. It, it helps our organs to function better when our cells are hydrated. Mm -hmm. Our body is 70% water. I think 70, 70, yeah, I think so. yeah, yeah, 70 70% water. Yeah. So um, yes, we should be drinking water, mm -hmm. um, but it should, it should be mineralized water. water. <laughs> so you could drink your gallon. You could drink your just... gallon, but if you're just peeing it out, then yeah. But fruits have minerals in them right. so we when you eat fruits especially off the land they allow us to hydrate as well so it's okay. not a replacement mm -hmm. but it definitely is part of part of our water consumption right. thank you so much um is there i mean through your work is there anything that you just that maybe i haven't asked you or anything that you would just want to leave in this space your health is the best investment right mm -hmm. it's the best investment and do not be intimidated by what health should look like mm -hmm. you know it's really really basic mm -hmm. it's very very simple yeah. it's a process yeah. and it's a journey yeah. and you'll and you have the opportunity to be on this journey for the rest of your life right. educate yourself go to someone who knows what they're talking about yeah. i love that well guys i hope you got something of value here, I hope there's something that you can take away that you can start doing today. It doesn't have to be everything. It could maybe be one thing, one small thing. Um, but I hope that through all of this, you're more encouraged to just make your health a priority and invest in your health. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Leah, as well. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>